Hi everyone, we'll get started in a couple of minutes, just giving enough people time to get into the, the meeting. Uh, today we're going to do a little bit on protein synthesis, and then we're going to talk about mitosis and the cell cycle specifically. So this should be on all specifications, so it should be something that does come up. So the lesson is already being recorded, so you don't have to record it. Um, it already is getting recorded anyway. And there will be an upload of the recording onto YouTube straight after this. So if you just go onto the Study Mind YouTube channel, um, there will be sort of registration for future sessions, but also um, you can find all the recordings from previous lessons, even if you miss one. Okay. Got not many people. Okay, we'll give it a sec, give it a sec. Right, might as well get started, good time. Right, so we're gonna start with a bit of revision actually, because we talked last lesson towards the end, we talked about the structure of DNA and polynucleotides, but one thing that I do wanna revise is the structure of RNA, because RNA is crucial in the process of protein synthesis. So it is important to just quickly revise that. Structure of RNA. So RNA is a single stranded polynucleotide chain. So like DNA, it's also the same. It is also a polynucleotide chain, but it's only got one strand. And it's got slightly different uh, RNA nucleotides. So they both share adenine. They both share cytosine. They both share guanine. But DNA has thymine, whereas RNA as uracil, uracil being the fourth nucleotide. And uracil replaces thymine, so it binds to adenine in the same way a thymine would normally do that in DNA. DNA also has a ribose sugar instead of a deoxy ribose sugar. They're both pentose sugars. They both have the same ribose backbone, but deoxy ribose has got oxygen taken off of it. And obviously this um, base uracil instead of base thymine. But that's the key kind of differences of RNA and DNA. Now, RNA, there are loads and loads of different forms of RNA. So let's just talk about it in a general structural form. So RNA has one polynucleotide chain, whereas DNA has two. So DNA is wound in a helix, whereas RNA is just single stranded. Obviously, they have slightly different nucleotides, the differences being related to specifically ultrastructure, so specifically base structure, and specifically the sugar. Um, ribose versus deoxyribose sugar, and AUCG versus ATCG, <coughs> as well as RNA being shorter and DNA being longer. This one is really important because this actually affects its function, because RNA as a molecule is designed to leave the nucleus and to partake in the process of protein synthesis. Whereas DNA stays within the nucleus and it doesn't take part in the process. Well, it does, but it doesn't actually move at all in the process of protein synthesis. Uh, is everyone else, can everyone else hear? Sorry, I just got a message saying I can't hear anything. Other people in the chat? Can? So it might just be a, might just be a sound problem from your perspective. Um, 
differences between DNA and RNA structure are really important. And so as I was saying, that it's related to the structure and the function. Uh, the structure does link to the function. And the ability to leave via the nuclear pores is something that's a really important functional aspect of RNA, but doesn't um, necessarily, it doesn't exist at all in DNA. And that's really important because it means that DNA is protected, whereas RNA can then go along and do protein synthesis. And obviously these are really important things to know about, but RNA also has substructures. So RNA isn't one thing, it's not a homogenous structure. It has different structures within it, within the types of RNA. So mRNA, messenger RNA, it does what it says on the tin. It's your chemical messenger. It messages between the nucleus, where the genetic material is, to your ribosome, where the proteins are being produced. So RNA passes that genetic information, mRNA particularly, passes that genetic information from DNA to allow for protein synthesis to happen. mRNA is produced in the nucleus and travels into the cytoplasm. DNA is in the nucleus of a cell, but the organelles responsible for making proteins are in the cytoplasm. DNA itself can't move out because of its double strand, it being too big to fit out the nuclear pore, which is why the relevant portion of the DNA is copied onto mRNA. Like DNA, mRNA is also made up of the nucleotides. However, in mRNA, a sequence of three consecutive base pairs are known as a codon. Each codon codes for one amino acid. And this is really important because codons, when we talk about mutations, which we will later on in today's session, um, codons are really important in that discussion because codons are the kind of things that we want to try and protect. We want to stop them from being mutated. Um, tRNA is another type of RNA in the cytoplasm, and tRNA exists within the structure of the ribosome. And tRNA has anticodons. So um, if you imagine a codon is on the DNA, an anticodon is complementary. So we remember complementary base pairing is the principle where basically for every adenine, there's always going to be a thymine, or for every adenine, there's always going to be a uracil, and there's complementary base pairing present. And tRNA has anticodons that are complementary to the codons on, um, on mRNA. And this means that tRNA is able to bring in specific amino acids and is able to bring these amino acids into place and able to make sure that those amino acids that are brought are complementary to the mRNA and by consequence and by extension from this protein synthesis process are complementary and are likened to the DNA before it. So that continues that process of making sure that the DNA, which is the genetic code, is actually consequentially coding for the protein at the end. So that's really important to understand. And the other side of tRNA has an area where the amino acids are bound to, and it brings the right amino acids into place. rRNA, or ribosomal RNA, is your structural RNA that forms the structure of the ribosome. So it consists of a large and small subunit that is made up of rRNA. And as amino acids are added along the growing peptide chain, the rRNA helps peptide bonds form by catalyzing the reaction between them. Okay, so that's from just basic revision um, of the structure of RNA. Does anyone have any questions about that? Let me check them out. Any questions? No. No, no, none in the chat. Cool. Okay. Synthesizing proteins. Um, sorry, it was a bit fast paced. Um, I will try and slow down, but we had, do have a lot to cover in a one hour session. So my advice is I will talk through a lot. Um, if you are struggling with the pacing a little bit, watch the recording on YouTube. Um, have it slowed down, but stay on this call um, just to make sure that the questions you get can be answered. So our bases on tRNA complementary to DNA. They're not actually complementary. They're actually pretty much the same. 
Because if you think about it, you've got DNA. DNA. Let's say it's got a base sequence of A, uh, C, and then G. The mRNA is going to have a sequence of U, G, C, but the tRNA is going to go back to your sequence of A, C, and G because it's complementary to the mRNA, so it's directly similar to the DNA. So it's not complementary to the DNA, but we'll talk about that later. I'm not going to talk about splicing, unfortunately, today. That's an A2 construct and I think we wouldn't have the time if I went into too much depth about it, but for principle, splicing does occur in the nucleus. Did mRNA make a codon? A codon is basically three bases that exist within the structure of mRNA. Do we do meiosis today? I don't think we'll have the time. Uh, un it'd be unlikely that we'll have the time to cover both mitosis and meiosis today, but meiosis is scheduled for another lesson later on. So a gene, a gene is a specific sequence of DNA, which code for a particular protein. So really important to understand that. A gene codes for, a, is, is DNA that codes for a specific protein. Um, so a gene has a function. All genes code for specific proteins. Genes are made of coding and non-coding DNA sequences. So they're made of and coding, um, coding exons and non-coding introns. And each gene has a unique base sequence of DNA. So remember, DNA is made up of four nucleotides, each with a unique base. It's either adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. The different genes have different base sequences, which means that they'll always code for different things. Remember, most genes code for proteins, but a few code for something called functional RNA. That's RNA that code for a particular purpose. I've got two questions here. Uh, Freya, would, do we need to know specific code on names? No. And K, if in, introns don't code, what are their purpose? That's a very long and complicated talk that I'm hoping to give after Christmas when I talk about introns and exons a little bit more detail. But I think today, for today, we're gonna try and keep it as simple as possible. We're not really going to delve into that. Polypeptides are coded for by genes. The order of amino acids in the polypeptide depends on the order of the nucleotide bases in the gene. That kind of makes sense because if it's in a particular order, then you are it's red in that order. So it's red from left from uh, five prime to three prime, and it will always be red like that. And you have um, so the order will determine how it's read. Each three bases is known as a codon and a codon codes for a specific amino acid. So each gene is basically a sequence of codons. Codons are what you would describe as non-overlapping, which means that each codon only codes for its particular amino acid. It does not specify the positions of other amino acids on the final protein. And codons are degenerate. This is really important to understand about the nature of DNA. Codons are degenerate, which basically means that even if you had a simple base mutation where one base was switched with another base, it is unlikely that that's actually going to change the codon that that or the, the actual amino acid that that codes on. Because what happens is that there are loads and loads of different codon options that can code for each amino acid. <coughs> For example, glycine can be made by four different codons. So even if you mutate the end, it wouldn't change the amino acid. There are a total of 64 codons in most organisms, but there are only 20 amino acids. So as you can understand, they, there's a lot more codons than there are amino acids. Three of the 64 codons are stop codons which signal the end of a polypeptide chain. One codon is the start codon. Start codon is always ATG or AUG, and it always codes for a methionine amino acid. So your proteins always start with methionine. 
And the remaining 60 amino acids, codons code for the 20 amino acids, um, they use to make proteins. Genetic code is universal, which means that it's the same in all living organisms, which means these codons will be the same in a rat, will be the same in a mouse, will be the same in a, in a bird, will be the same in a plant, because they're consistent across all life. Two stages of protein synthesis, transcription. So transcription, what, what does the word transcription actually mean? So when you transcribe something, what you're doing is you're changing it from, you're writing down something. So transcription in normal kind of, when, when you're in a lesson, you're taking notes, you're transcribing what your professor, what your lecturer, what your teacher, or what is on the slides. You're transcribing it. So what you're doing is you're converting it from the format that's being delivered to you to another format in your written form. And transcription in the amino acid sense of it is transferring from the format of DNA to the format of mRNA so it can be transferred to the ribosomes. And this takes place in the nucleus. So transcription has to start with DNA unwinding. It always will, because remember, you can't bind. And, and transcription as a process actually is very similar to DNA replication. It's got virtually the same enzymes. There's slight changes to it, but apart from that, it's virtually the same as DNA replication. So what you do is you start similarly to DNA replication where DNA double helix is unwound. This is not done by RNA polymerase. This is done by DNA helicase again. So helicase enzyme does break down. I will, I will change that so that for your notes, so you don't make the mistake. And I will repeat that. It is not done by RNA polymerase. It's done by DNA helicase. Apologies for my bad handwriting. I'm trying to write with a mouse. Um, and the, the aim of that is to break the hydrogen bonds and that creates two exposed strands of DNA. Once you've created two exposed strands of DNA, what you're doing is again, so you start at something called the promoter region. The promoter region is the beginning of this kind of strand. And what it is, is it's the bit where RNA polymerase can bind, but RNA polymerase binds for other purposes, but it signals for the beginning of transcription to happen. I'll, I'll like come back to promoter regions when I, once I've explained the basics of this. So now you've got an exposed strand of DNA. You've got these free RNA nucleotides that are in the uh, nuclear cytosol. Um, as uh, Zahid is saying, it is very similar to the replication fork process. Uh, but you've got this exposed, you've got this exposed strand of DNA, and you've got basically three nucleotides that are coming in from the cytosol, and they're coming in and they're binding to the free nucleotides that are on the DNA. And this will result in an mRNA molecule that is complementary to our strand of interest. So it will result in a complementary RNA strand. Now the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region. An RNA polymerase, you don't need to worry about this anti-sense and sense strand, but the way you want to think about this is that the template or the RNA strand is called the anti-sense strand and the, um, and the original DNA strand is called the sense strand. So the mRNA is built on the, R anti the mRNA that's built is the anti-sense and the mRNA that's used in the sense. So we've now got these three nucleotides that are hydrogen bound to your DNA molecule. And when they're hydrogen bound, they need to still form their sugar phosphate backbone. So this is what is done by RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase, catalyzes the condensation reactions within the backbone of the nucleotides. And again, is similar to DNA polymerase, it will only work in a five to three direction. And it, when similar to DNA polymerase, it also proofreads to protect against any mutations. Um, what example is that? It's in most examples, 
Again, the level of detail you need to know about it will vary. I think a lot of this is slightly more detailed than you would need to know. But again, it's still useful to learn because you will come back to this in A2. So polymerase works in, yeah, it works in the five prime to three prime run. So at the end of the RNA polymerase is something called the terminator region. And at the terminator region, the RNA polymerase now disjoins and will then the DNA helicase leaves and the DNA is able to form its hydrogen bonds again and becomes rewound. And you've produced mRNA. Okay, we're not going to talk about this today. I'm not going to talk about introns and exons. Again, that's an A2 construct, and we will that will be talked about in more depth later on. So what you've done is you've done kind of, so if you imagine you've broken this DNA strand in two, and you've done this with DNA helicase, you've got three nucleotides that come along and bind to the DNA, and they bind to the antisense strand of the DNA and they form hydrogen bonds. But these nucleotides are not yet joined together. So RNA polymerase comes along and condenses the formation of the sugar phosphate backbone. What does five prime to three prime mean? Um, I explained this in the last lesson, but what it means is basically uh, five prime is one end of the, basically there's something called primer proteins that are found on the end of DNA molecules. And what they do is they orientate how DNA can bind. The way you, I would like to, uh, the way I think about it is they're kind of like, um, they're kind of like compass guides and they kind of guide where different enzymes can bind to them. And one of them is a five prime and the other one is a three prime. Um, and you always go from five prime to three prime. It's just small proteins that exist on the ends of DNA molecules. Do we get Okazaki fragments occurring here? No, no Okazaki fragments in transcription. So now this mature mRNA molecule will now be used as a template and it is then leaves the DNA, uh, leaves the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasm, into the process of translation. So it now goes to the ribosomes. And ribosomes are cellular organelles where polypeptides are synthesized, you know this. mRNA is going to bind to this ribosome. A tRNA molecule carrying a specific amino acid on one end will recognize the start codon. So it'll recognize AUG on the uh, mRNA molecule. And the tRNA will bind to that start codon by a complementary anticodon. At this point, it will bring the methionine amino acid with it. A second mRNA molecule carrying another, the next codon's anticodon will come and bind to the mRNA. The ribosome rRNA will then, has an enzyme called peptidyl transferase. And using this enzyme peptidyl transferase will catalyze the formation of a peptide bond between two amino acids. Once the peptide bond is formed, the tRNA are free to leave the ribosome and, and bring another amino acid and continue this chain. Um, they then return with new amino acids and bind to mRNA at corresponding codons. And this process of forming peptide bonds between amino acids will continue to repeat. Translation ends at the stop codon. This is because there are no tRNA molecules that have anticodons corresponding to the sequence of a stop codon. The reason is because the stop codon does not code for an amino acid. So translation will always end at a stop codon. The tRNA molecule will detach and there will be nothing left that occurs after that. Okay, any questions about the processes of transcription and translation? open to questions. No? Anyone else? Feel free to ask anything here.
Was it the ribosome that identifies the star codon or tRNA? It's tRNA. So tRNA has an anti-codon that is complementary to the star codon, which is why the star codon is com it, the star codon is coding. It does code for an amino acid. Star codon doesn't. Any other questions? But transcription doesn't it happen in the cytoplasm for plants and for animals happens in the nucleus? I've never heard that. I'm pretty sure for any uh, eukaryotic organism, it happens in the nucleus. And for prokaryotes, it happens in the cytoplasm. But um, but that that would that then that would be my kind of assumption. And I think that's what your exams would expect you to know. Anyone else? Okay. Mutations. So if the gene in a DNA molecule gets altered then this change will carry through when the mRNA molecule is made. This will cause the wrong amino acid to be added and thus the wrong polypeptide chain will be made. So we're gonna talk about mutations quickly. We'll talk about them more in depth later on. Deletion, substitution, and inter insertions. So deletion mutation is basically where one or multiple bases get deleted from the gene. This will result in a shorter protein than intended because the genes coding for some of the amino acids are missing. This will also result in something called a frame shift. Basically, if I have a very long chain, and so I've got A, T, C, G, A, C, T, C, G. Let's say I've got this. My codons are the, these three, right? So the three amino acids I'm coding for are ATC, GAC, and TCG. Those are your three codons. If I do a deletion, let's say I delete the C here. What that does is that changes my codons because now all of my codons will be different, will be off by one. ATG, ACT, and CG, and CG followed by whatever's next. If it's maybe A, then it'll be CGA. All of your amino acids are then going to be different. This is really important to understand because this is why deletion and insertion mutations, because they both result in frame shifts, are much more damaging to an individual protein than say a substitution mutation. So substitutions are when one or multiple bases in the original gene get swapped for another base. This means that the length of the polypeptide will remain the same, but with potentially one wrong amino acid as its constituent. So it maybe have will have a different amino acid to what it kind of was meant to have. Insertions when one or multiple bases get added to the original gene, this creates a longer polypeptide chain with additional amino acids, which should not be present. And again, this does result in a frame shift. So substitutions don't result in frame shifts, but deletions and insertions do have frame shift implications. Point mutations are when deletion substitutions and insertions occur to only a single nucleotide. This can be seen in a disease called sickle cell anemia, where there's a valine to glycine mutation in humans, and it leads to red blood cells being abnormally shaped. Um, sorry, uh, glutamic acid to valine transmission. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, any questions about mutations? No worries if you don't. To begin our discussion on the cell cycle now. So this will be the second part of the lesson. Hopefully this wouldn't take won't take us too long, but 
Chromosomes are lots and lots of DNA molecules put together. A DNA molecule has lots of genes, and genes have lots of bases. Chromosomes are large structures of DNAs and proteins. And DNA in cells is wrapped around a protein called histones, which results in something called chromatin, and chromatin then coils into chromosomes. Humans are diploid organisms, which means we have two sets of each chromosome, one inherited from our mother, one inherited from our father. And that leads to 46 chromosomes in a single new cell nucleus. Our gametes, our sperm and egg cells, are haploid cells, which means that they only consist of one copy of a chromosome each. One copy of a chromosome is called a chromatid, and each copy is made up of each chromosome is made up of two copies, and the two copies are joined together at a centromere. So chromatids have two arms joined together as a, uh, a centromere, and this is one copy of a chromosome as a whole. So they all both have two arms, two chromatids that join together as centromere. Yeah. And this replicates during the S phase, and it creates two copies of each chromosome. Normally we have 46. After an S phase, the cell will have 92 chromosomes, making it tetraploid, but then that is obviously going to be a dividing cell, so it is obviously going to divide. And the new copies of chromosomes are called homologous chromosomes. Telomers protect the chromosome during cell divisions. They're small bits at the end of every chromatid. And what they do is these telomers get shorter and shorter, but after a particular point when the telomers go, the cell can't undergo any more cell division. So it doesn't. And telomers protect from mutations. And there's something called the Hayflick constant. The Hayflick constant is the number of times, the maximum number of times the cell can undergo cell division before the cell division stops. So, cell cycle. The cell cycle is a regulated series of events that occur during cell division. <coughs> and this process is one parent cell dividing to form two genetically identical daughter cells. And it can be broken down into three phases. Interphase, which can be further subdivided. Interphase can be subdivided into your G1 and G2 and your S phase. So G1 and G2 are on the, each side of the S phase, and their function is to produce new proteins, organelles, and ATP prepping the cell for cell cycle. Basically, getting the cell ready, G1 and G2. And then the S phase is your cell division phase. That's kind of the three phases of interphase. And then mitosis is the process of cell division itself. So it's where nucleus divides and chromatids can separate. And then the last phase is, is not as long as this is making it out to be, but cytokinesis, it's the end of telophase, two cells, one cell divides to form two. So here are the three stages again, G1, G2, and S. So G1 phase, the cell grows and makes a new set of organelles and proteins for the daughter cells. S phase, cellular DNA is replicated and the two daughter cells get each get one set of DNA. Genetic material is also being checked at this point. G2 is where the cell continues growing and there's synthesis of special proteins and ATP, especially in preparation for mitosis. I'm going to let I'm going to give you a second to write this down because it's quite important. We'll talk about G0 slightly later. It is in this lecture. Talk.
Okay. During interphase, the cell can still function normally. The cell cycle ends with mitosis. During mitosis, the cell splits into two identical cells, and cytokinesis is the process. Oh, um, yeah. We're, we're going to talk a lot more detail about mitosis. I don't know why they've explained it in a bit more detail here. Um, I, will, I will talk about this, though, the reasons we do cell division. So uh, cell division has multiple functions. Growth. Multicellular organisms grow in size by increasing the number of cells in their body through mitosis, replacing dead cells. So dying cells are replaced by identical cells that are produced during mitosis and the repair of tissues by cell replacement. So in eukaryotes, most structures which have become damaged can be replaced by new daughter cells. And then the last reason for cell division is asexual reproduction. Some organisms reproduce asexually through mitosis. Okay, I've got a couple of questions here. What about G0 phase? So I'll quickly explain what G0 phase is. So it's called quiescence. It's the process, it kind of comes off the cell cycle and it exists kind of here, G0. It's known as quiescence and basically it's the phase in which there is no cell division happening. Basically cell division does not happen in quiescence. It's where cells <coughs> that have become highly specialized and have become fully specialized that don't need to divide anymore, they go into quiescence and they then can re-enter the cell cycle later on. Um, can you explain the chromosome and chromatid number during interphase? Yeah. So at the beginning, you start with your normal diploid cell. Um, so it's two times the number, two times the number of chromosomes, but that divides. So that replicates. You double that 4N. You've got 4N all the way through G2. In mitosis, you also have 4N. You've got four times the number of DNA. But at the end of mitosis, before you get to G01, you divide the cell and it goes back to being 2N again. Does chromatin have a part in mitosis? It does. I'll we'll talk about that now. Okay. The process of mitosis. There's an acronym for this, IPMAT. Interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. It makes sense if you understand any in, in Greek. So I'll explain this kind of from a, from a Greek phrase. So interphase, inter just being between phases. So between mitosis is the best way to think about it. Prophase, the best way to think about this is, this is the pro or P for preparation. P equals preparatory phase. Metaphase, M, middle, which is important because it's both the middle phase of mitosis but also in metaphase, they, the chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell. They line up on the metaphase plate, which is in the middle. Anaphase, A for apart. Um, A, so they're being pulled apart, anaphase. A for being, the chromosomes are being pulled apart. And telo, telos, is Greek for end. So telos in Greek means the end, which means that the telophase is the final phase or the finalizing phase. And cytokinesis, if you break that word down, cyto for cell and kinesis for movement or motion. So it's the movement of the cell apart, basically. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about what happens in mitosis. So interphase is those G1, S, and G2. So we've talked about these before. So the cell becomes tetraploid. The cell produces the proteins needed and produces ATP. Prophase. Three things crucially happen in prophase. Chromosomes condense as they become shorter and thicker, making them visible as two sister chromatids. The centrioles split 
and produce mitotic spindle fibers. And the nuclear chromosome envelope disintegrates and the chromosomes enter the cell. And this is really important. This is your phasic kind of, diff this is your three kind of memorization things that you need to learn. Chromosomes condense, spindle fibers form, nuclear envelope disintegrates. If there's F, there will be exam questions on explaining mitosis. I'll give you a second to digest that. It is important. Okay, we've got a question. What about nucleolus? Yeah, so the nucleolus basically just merges in with the cytoplasm because the nucleolus is the cytoplasm of the nucleus. So it just merges in with the cytoplasm, it's released. Okay, metaphase. So the nuclear envelope is completely gone. What you've got is you've got spindle fibers now attached to the centromeres of each chromosome. And these chromosomes are then pulled into the middle. So they're pulled together and they line up at the equator or the middle of the, of the structure. They line up at the middle. The spindle fibers pull the chromosomes, lining them up at the metaphase plate. That's all that happens. It's preparation. Again, this is all part of the preparatory process. Anaphase is the real main kind of, the way I think about it is anaphase is the big one for how far it goes. Anaphase is pulling apart. So you've got these chromosomes and what happens is the spindle fibers contract. So the spindle fibers contract and they pull, because remember they're at the ends. So the spindle fibers start at the centrioles, which are at either pole. So what they're doing is they're pulling the respective chromosome towards the opposite poles of the cell. This then splits each chromosome into two V-shaped sister chromatid structures, and each of these goes apart, and this then separates back into the normal number of chromosomes you require for yourself. So at either pole, you've now got 46 chromosomes. And telophase is three things happen in telophase. And you can guess what those three things are because they're the exact opposite of the three things that have happened in prophase. So the way you remember this is whatever happens in prophase has to go back to normal in telophase. So telophase, nuclear envelope reforms, chromatids uncoil, and the spindle fibers disintegrate. So spindle fibers formed in prophase, spindle fibers disintegrate in telophase. Chromatids, chromosomes condensed into chromatids, chromatids uncoil and uncondense. Nuclear envelope disintegrated, nuclear envelope reforms. That's the way you remember that, the three opposites. Spindle fibers are made of microtubules and they're part of the, they're part of the cytoskeleton structure. And now you've got cytokinesis. So cytokinesis is separation of the cells into two identical daughter cells. And this is done through something called a cleavage furrow. Uh, so basically the cytoplasm invaginates. So it kind of um, comes inward at two different points in the middle along the metaphase plate. And this cleavage furrow then basically pulls and then it's pulled apart at that point. But again, that's complex biology that you don't really need to worry about. There is no link. Uh, this is a very good question out of it. Is there a link to lysosomes Are there zones in the disintegration of spindle fibers? No. Disintegration of spindle fibers is not done from, a, from an, it's not a protein. It's not done through an intracellular process. It's basically, they regress. Okay. So this is a diagrammatic form of basically everything that's happening. Interphase, prophase, everything condenses. Metaphase, they line up. Anaphase, they pull apart, and telophase, the opposite happens in prophase. Okay, 
now practically envis envisioning that. So this is the last thing we'll do before I open up to questions and um, we sort of wrap up. Uh, preparing a root tip cell squash. So this is a light microscopy exercise about how we prepare or how we view um, cells under the microscope. So what you need is you need warm hydrochloric acid in a water bath at 60 degrees. You cut one to two centimeters from a growing root. And it, this is in the active region where mitosis is occurring. <laughs> and you wash that root, trip, root tip and you dry on filter paper. You transfer the root tip to warm acid. Warm acid is going to basically dissolve the cell membranes. You remove from acid and wash the root tip again. And you place this root tip now on a slide and you stain um, with hematoxylin and eosin, which you might not have heard of ever, but hematoxylin and eosin is a particular stain that helps differentiate. It's a differential stain for acid and alkali. So it differentiates between nucleus, which contains lots of acid, and alkali, which doesn't. Um, and you break open the root tip. Again, after you've done this, you cover with your cover slip. But again, you don't do this, you know, you do this in a slow and gradual process. So what you've done is you've started at a 45 degree angle and you're slowly moving this down. Remember, you want to press firmly. One thing you can do is you can add a drop of water to this and adding a drop of water will help increase the resolution of this. Um, again, you add a drop of water just before you put your cover slip on. And the further you press down, the more, the thinner your root tip will be. And then you put this under an optical microscope and you create these cells. So you can see which cells are actively undergoing cell division. So you've got cells like A, which are not dividing, cells like B, which are in interphase, cells like C, which are mitotic, they're actually a metaphase or anaphase, and cells like E, which are sort of in that end process where they're redividing and they're going back to being two cells. And why do we use multiple root tips? Uh, so multiple root tips will increase your chance of getting good images. Why is acid to use? And acid separates cells together, enabling more stain to easily enter the cell. What does the stain bind to? Different stains can be used, but many bind to chromatin DNA or they bind to DNA in the nucleus. And how would you change your experiment to improve your end images? You would increase the amount of time spent in HCL, increase the temperature of incubation, and increase the amount of time spent in the stain. Right, I am going to stop that. Um, sorry, Kay, I'm not going to go back, but uh, what you could do is, again, look at the YouTube link, uh, which will be available on the Study Mind YouTube channel, which I'll send across here just for you all to have access to. So all of the recordings from every previous lesson is on there and you can go through them slightly slower and it might be more of an appropriate kind of way to go through things. Right, I'm opening myself up to any questions. Can you see the nucleolus during prophase? No, you wouldn't be able to differentiate. Good question out of it. You wouldn't be able to differentiate for the nucleolus during prophase because the nucleolus kind of just, um, oh, actually, no, sorry. You meant during prophase. Yes, you would. In prophase, you would because there's still, in, there is at the beginning of prophase, a cell in prophase is at the beginning of prophase and you would be able to see that because there would still be a nuclear envelope differentiating it. In metaphase, you wouldn't be able to do that because it, the, it appears very similar to um, to um, to the cytoplasm. Do we need to memorize that practical? Depends on your specification. I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going. Unfortunately, I don't know for every specification. It is something that does get asked in AQA and in OCRA. So the two main specifications that are done by most students, it does tend to get asked there.
Could I explain a bit about HNRA? HNRA, that is a good question. Uh, so it's pre-MR, pre-mRNA. So this is mRNA that contains both your introns and your exons. So it's mRNA pre-gene splicing. It's mRNA before things have been removed from it. It's an interesting uh, construct, but basically it is just mRNA that needs to still undergo splicing. Can I have a summary? Yes, I'll provide a summary for the people who've stayed. Uh, so summary today. So in today's lesson, we covered uh, both, we covered, uh, we started with a quick revision of RNA. So we talked about the structure of RNA. We talked about the differences between RNA and DNA, RNA being single-stranded, RNA having uracil instead of thymine, RNA uh, having D uh, ribose instead of deoxyribose. And we talked about the types of mRNA. So mRNA, tRNA, rRNA. Um, we then talked about the process of MER protein synthesis, a crucial process in your examination. Um, so transcription and translation. So transcription beginning with <laughs> DNA, DNA helicase unwinding, free RNA nucleotides coming along and binding, forming hydrogen bonds, RNA polymerase coming in, um, forming the backbone, mRNA then leaving the nucleus and going towards the ribosome, codons on the RNA, mRNA, bind to anticodons on the tRNA and complementary amino acids are brought into place. That is the process of protein synthesis. Then we moved on to the cell cycle. So in the last 30 minutes, we've talked about the cell cycle. We've talked about uh, interphase. So G1 and G2, which is the process where proteins and organelles are reformed, as well as ATP is formed, prepping the cell for the next process. Uh, S phase, cell division, and then mitosis, interphase, prophase, metaphase, and anaphase, and telophase. So prophase preparation, three things happen in prophase. Spindle fibers form, nuclear envelope de decomposes, and chromatin condenses. The opposite three things happen in telophase. So remember that three, three for prophase, three for telophase. Metaphase, cells, um, chromatids line up on the metaphase plate, anaphase, chromatids pull apart. And telophase, the opposite three things happen. Um, could I go over the G0 phase? Yeah, so G0 phase is quiescent. It's the phase of non-cell division. So it's where there isn't any cell division going on. And it's the phase where basically cells stay if they're either too old to undergo any more cell division, or they're already specialized enough. They don't need to undergo cell division anymore. They've formed maximal specification, specialization. How do spindle fibers form? So spindle fibers form from the microtubules and uh, um, but you don't need to know that. Okay. Um, I've been asked a good question here. <clears throat> so I can I ask if I'm aware about the use of fractals in determining cancer progression? It's a bit off topic, but I'm doing a research paper and I thought I'd help in getting some insight. I will explain that, but I will kind of come back to them a little bit later. Um, I will I will answer that right at the end once most people kind of have left because I think it would be more useful at that point. Ligase involved in protein synthesis? No, because there are no Okazaki fragments involved. Ligase enzyme is used in genetic engineering. Not only genetic engineering, Manahill, it's also used in DNA replication to join Okazaki fragments in the lagging strand of DNA replication together. Um, how many chromatids and chromosomes? So there will be 92 chromatids at, mm, there will be 92, sorry, got to get this right way around. Yeah, so humans have 46 chromosomes. Um, Yeah, humans have 46 chromosomes. So after interphase, there'll be 92 chromosomes and there'll be a hundred and, well, whatever, 184 chromatids because there'll be two of them. K 
can two more more mutations occur on a single gene at the same time? Yes, they can. It's called pleiotropy. It's a weird cancer term, but yes, you can have more than one mutation happening on a single gene at the same time. Okay, I am going to wrap up, but if people want to stay behind to listen to a bit about fractals, it's pretty interesting. So, um, basically, fractals are a reference to chaos within the cell. Um, basically, they refer to how chaotic intracellular processes are. So, a fractal is how um, it's it's geometrical. So if a surface is described as fractal, a surface is basically geometrically aligned. So it repeats itself at different intervals. But non-cancer cells, cancer cells are often very different to the structures that they're within, and they're often chaotic. So they often don't have as many fractals, which means that you have basically two different types of cancer cells. You have benign or benign neoplastic cancer cells. So you can start with something called dyscariosis. So dyscariosis is the process of basically having cancer cells that are kind of confusing looking, but or cells that are, they have differences, but they're not cancerous yet. They don't have enough mutation. So the cells aren't actually grossly, if you look at it microscopically, it wouldn't appear that fractal. But if you looked at it more closely, um, you would still notice there would be nuclear changes. But in more malignant cancer cells, there are so many more mutations that the cells appear so much more fractal that the cells basically become a complete mess when they're, when they look, when they're within kind of a tissue that um, they don't have the same recurring patterns of geometric progression, which means that the more fractal a cell is, the worse the prognosis of cancer, basically. Does that um, suffice as a good question answer about fractals? But in order to supplement your research, Hanin, what I would recommend doing is basically researching not only fractals, but researching dyscariosis, researching something called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which is a precursor to cervical cancer. It's what we use in cervical screening. Um, researching that, researching dyscariosis, researching the stages of cancer progression, so benign to malignant, basically, and that would be a very useful starting point. Cool. It's seven o'clock, so I'm going to wrap up, but I will see you on Sunday.